Welcome everyone to this Learning from Earthquakes webinar. I'm Maggie Ortiz Milan, Program Manager at the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few logistics. You can choose to listen to the webinar through your computer or your phone in the control panel. During the presentation, please submit your questions or comments in the questions panel, and these will be addressed at the end of the presentation. The webinar recording will be posted on EERI's YouTube channel after the webinar. The Palo Indonesia Reconnaissance Team that you'll hear from today was supported through EERI's Learning from Earthquakes program. EERI has been conducting post-earthquake reconnaissance since 1948 and was formalized as LFE in 1973 with support from NSF. The program has a multidisciplinary focus and engages a combination of academics and practitioners. The mission of the LFE program is to accelerate and increase learning from earthquake-induced disasters that affect the natural, built, social, and political environments worldwide. The LFE website contains information from over 300 earthquakes in 50 countries. In recent years, the LFE committee has begun to consider what can be learned about community resilience through reconnaissance. Beginning with the Resilience Observatory Project in 2012, which was funded through a grant from NSF, EERI developed the Resilience Reconnaissance Framework. Following the development of the framework, several LFE efforts have piloted different approaches to resilience reconnaissance. This webinar focuses on the most recent LFE resilience reconnaissance effort, a reconnaissance team focused on population displacement following the 2018 Palu Indonesia earthquake and tsunami. So today, Go ahead. today you'll hear from uh, Robert Olshansky, who is the, the team leader, um, Professor Emeritus in Urban Planning at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Kaneko Ayuchi, Associate Professor at Tohoku University International Institute of Disaster Science, Ghazala Naeem, Architect and Disaster Risk Management Consultant from Pakistan, and Rama Hanifa, Center for Earthquake Science and Technology Research Center for Disaster Mitigation at uh, the uh, Technical Institute of Bandung. And uh, we really like to say a, a great thank you to Rama, who was really instrumental in helping this reconnaissance team um, travel to uh, Palu. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rob. Great, thank you, Maggie. Um, I was I was going to briefly introduce our team, but you uh, here we are. Um, I guess, um, and and also uh, a special thanks to Rahma, who's our, our our was our research partner with Institute of Technology Bandung and our host extraordinaire for um, for our trip. And you'll see you'll see all of the great um, collaborations and stakeholder meetings that we've held as part of the trip. Um, and I guess I just also want to point out. Um, that we have a pretty geographically diverse team here, and we are all present from um, very different time zones right now, from uh, from California, Japan, Pakistan, and um, and Indonesia. Uh, so um, so let's get started. Um, I will let's see. I will start with. It's not working. Let me try again. I'm trying to advance the slide. There we go. Um, so we'll just start off by saying where where was this? So this is uh, Palu in central Sulawesi in Indonesia. Um, you could see on the map on the left uh, with faults shown. You could see uh, Indonesia. Uh, Jakarta is here. Uh, Sumatra, Java, Bali is here. And the island of Sulawesi is up here. It has four provinces on it. Um, and Palu is in the province of central Sulawesi. And if we zoom in, I think it's useful to see the geography of Palu. Um, there's this long bay. And the city of Palu is at the head of the bay. Palu has approximately a population of about 300,000 people. And it's notable, and we may talk about later, that it's a relatively new city built in pretty much the last uh, 50 years. Um, there had been some Dutch settlements in the area. There was a Dutch port up here um, in Dongala. Um, but, but Palu itself has a, been a relatively new and growing city. 
So now I'm going to pass it over to uh, Gazala to tell us about the basics of the earthquake. Thank you, Rob. Um, hi, everyone. This is Ghazala from Pakistan. I will share an overview of seismic event of 28 September 2018 and its impact that we are focusing on um, for our resilience reconnaissance study. The 7.5 magnitude earthquake was caused by the strike slip movement of Palo Coro Fault that is known to be capable of producing such large earthquakes. Uh, if, you, if you see this uh, earthquake shaking intensity map, the Palukor Fault um, is moving throughout the bay, crossing the Palu City and then moving inland at the Sulawesi Island. Maximum shaking of eight on modified Mercury scale was observed near the epicenter, which is about 72 uh, kilometers away from Palu City in the north. This shallow earthquake of 10 kilometer depth had intensive effects of ground shaking, tsunami, liquefaction, and landslides that have all together resulted in nearly 5,000 fatalities and thousands of building damage. I'm trying to, um, trying to go to the next slide, but. Uh oh, uh, the slide is not moving. Yes, mm, tsunami. The earthquake shook the area around 6 p.m. local time when local festive celebrations were ongoing in the city, mainly on the beaches. Tsunami arrived on shores within minutes with limitation of existing tsunami early warning system and disruption of dissemination chain. Official warning could not work. The tsunami was captured in a number of videos and also measured on tide gauge. It appeared to have maximum run up of uh, nine meter just in a few minutes. The map shows tsunami run up at different locations in the Bay Area. Several discussions are still ongoing to explain the primary cause of such fast approaching tsunami, either by strike slip movement or multiple slope failures or large submarine landslide, or maybe a combination of all such features uh, contributed in tsunami generation. Our next slide. Um, maybe Rob, you can help me moving to the next slide, please. It's not working from my... Uh, Computer. Do you want this? Is this the one you want to be on? Tsunami effects? Yeah, yeah, tsunami effects. Okay. Yeah, tsunami okay. effects. And then I'll try uh, to. Unmute. In the slide. Okay, please. Thank you. The map on the slide shows tsunami damage with relative color shading. You can see most of the damage was in the southern part of the bay, that is the Palu city, at the mouth of the uh, Palu river, where the inundation marked 200 to uh, 300 meters inland, and in the north, it remained 15 meters inland on average. Next, please. Uh, coastal slope failures incidents were observed at least at six locations. These two images show relative shoreline in pre and post earthquake satellite imageries. The color chunk on right side um, imagery shows the slope failure area in Western Palu Bay. We visited two of such sites and those seem to be old landfill areas of Dutch period. Houses built on such landfills were washed away with, by tsunami, uh, which resulted in fatalities. Next, please. Landslide up to several kilometers in size were triggered by liquefaction along the floor of Palu Valley with an average gradient of, of uh, two to four percent. 
in local language, this phenomena is called Nalodo. The map on the right side, it shows ground deformation location in Palo Basin. These area include rice farming fields and residential area and probably accounts for most of the life loss due to the earthquake. Nalodo is observed at five locations um, affecting four, four square kilometer area in total approximately and with a maximum displacement of 1200 meters. This table presents affected areas, damage and displacement uh, at each location. Next please. Uh, nearly 5,000 fatalities were attributed to earthquakes, tsunami, nilodo, waterfront landslides, and surface fall rupture. The map on the right side uh, shows tsunami and earthquake damage in Palu and Sigi regions, where the damage by earthquake shaking is relatively larger and marked in darker color, you can see. The table here, it presents the details of fatalities in four affected districts. You can see the Palu was badly affected with 80% of the total death toll. Next, please. In terms of household displacement, over 63,000 buildings were partially or completely damaged. Um, in terms of displacement, approximately 200,000 people were physically displaced or were too frightened to stay at home. The process um, of displacement initiated uh, immediately after the event when the residents evacuated on their own to find a safer location. Then after a week or so, they began to organize themselves in formal or informal camps. In next phase, formal camps were settled by the government and non-government organizations called Huntaras. The next and final stage will be setting up relocation sites called Huntap, or people will rebuild their own buildings at the same locations. The table here presents housing damage in four affected districts where Palu alone received 50% of the total building damage. Next slide, please. Um, our research goal for this trip is to study population movement, focusing on both short-term population displacement and plans for long-term population relocation following this disaster event. Such population displacement happens after every um, mega disaster, leaving long-term social and economic impacts on the victims. You can see um, in the picture on the left side, this is a tent camp set up by the government soon after 2005 earthquake happened in Kashmir in Pakistan. On the right side, you can see this is a permanent relocation site after 10 years of 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, Aceh, Indonesia. Next, please. Um, our Palu team is led by Professor Oshansky from University of Illinois, and he has researched disaster recovery for over two decades in many countries, including Indonesia. Kanako Luchi from Tohoku University, he has a vast research experience on post-disaster housing relocation issues in many countries. Myself, I'm a disaster management practitioner, an architect, and my interest is um, tsunami warning chain and community preparedness. Rahma Hanifa from Center for Earthquake Science and Technology ITB Bandung Indonesia is our collaborator and she has been a very good host and a guide during the study trip. She is also our next presenter. Rama, please proceed. Rob, please, in the next slide. Thank you. And then I'll leave Rahma if you can advance your own slides. We'll see if that works. Oh, you're there, Rachma. Okay. Thank you, uh, Prasad and Andrea. It's uh, really an honor to join the team 
on this elective program to follow, which I can also benefit learning a lot from um, the every team, Safra, Tanaka Sensei, and Gazala. Uh, uh, I represent here from the National Center for Earthquake Studies, facilitated by Ministry of Public Work and Housing. And we uh, have a um, very nice uh, host also from Batana, uh, all the Ministry of National Development Planning, which is our uh, also our partner, our main partner in Indonesia, uh, and uh, also from uh, Puskian and ITB, Ministry of PUPR, and the local partners in Palu is the Tadulaka University and also the local community, so called Forum Sudut Pandang. Um, and also we have um, uh, you inspire or a platform of youth and young professionals in science and technology for disaster reproduction that was helping us during the field survey. Um, next, I cannot, I cannot, uh, okay, thank you. So uh, we were, uh, we, we managed to meet several stakeholders from the government, the academia, and also from international um, uh, uh, international agencies and also from the local communities, NGOs and others. Uh, from the government, mainly uh, other than Bapanas, we also uh, meet the Ministry of Agrarian Affairs and Social Planning, or APL, and we also um, meet the Task Force for Rehabilitation and Reconstruction of Central Polarity Earthquake from the Ministry of Public Work and Housing. Also, the national disaster management authorities, uh, including the provincial and um, regional and um, regency, regency uh, of uh, disaster management authorities. We also met the geological agencies and um, the national planning of the province and Palu city. And in academia, uh, other than Pusken, uh, we also met the Indonesian Society for Geotechnical Engineering the Indonesia Institute of Science, University of Indonesia. Uh, and uh, we met, uh, we make a small SDD in University of Tadulako. And we also have an expert panel in Institute Technology Bandung after the Palu survey. Um, Prof. Rob and Kanako Sensei and Gazala at the time also uh, uh, delivered a lecture for the, for ICD. And um, we met UNESCO that um, coordinated the international survey team uh, on the first year after the Palu earthquake. We met JICA and we were lucky that JICA also uh, was together with us in uh, Palu survey. We met the villagers, uh, head of the village, secretary of the village of Lonca and Pulawi. And also we met several uh, local community, uh, Forum Sudut Pandang, Sikola Pamore, Sikola Mombile, and etc. Next. Rahma, can you yes. please uh, adjust your microphone? It, we are having difficulty hearing you clearly. It seems like there's a lot of noise around it. Can you hear me better now? That is perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. And so for the site survey, we uh, managed to survey almost um, most area of the tsunami affected um, area from the western uh, coastal area and the eastern coastal area and also the Palu Bay. Uh, we managed to visit the liquefaction affected. The main is Petobo, Jono Oge, and Balaroa. And then we also visited the fault rupture affected area because it's um, quite a large fault rupture of five meters. Uh, so we visited that as well. And we visited several um, Huntara or the temporary housing sh or shelter uh, uh, belonging to the, made by the government uh, and also community-based Huntara and also NGO Develop Huntara. And we visited the uh, ongoing, um, ongoing process of the permanent relocation housing in Tondo and Pombewe and also in uh, Duyu. So there are three main huntap that is currently being constructed. And we also visited an in-situ um, permanent relocation or it's a smaller case of uh, relocated um, permanent housing. Uh, that's um, this, the map is showing uh, all our roads. Uh, it's maybe about spending about 150 kilometers from the north to the southern part. 
Um, so that's the overview of our survey. Okay, we'll see. Um, so yes, thank you. Now um, I will be talking about the moving of people, how people are displaced and then how they are planning to be in the permanent relocation site. So immediately after the earthquake and then tsunami, Nalodo and landslide happened, people went outside their homes and then gathered to places where they felt were most safe. And eventually it became the, uh, informal camps, the evacuation center. So at three, sorry, at uh, half a year after the earthquake, um, there were approximately about 400 informal camps. And then the uh, total population living in that kind of camps were estimated to be about 173,000 people. And I also need somebody help me advance the slide, please. Oops. Okay, thank you. And so um, after the um, informal camps has been established, temporary shelter called Huntara in uh, Bahasa, Indonesia, uh, has been also established. So as of May, um, May of 2019, 72 Huntara sites were established by the government. And that was accommodating about 700 units or 700 households. And um, on top of that, the NGOs, there were about 30 that has established Huntaras uh, and accommodating approximately 8,500 units. And so here, the NGOs has established much more number of housing units than the government unit. But you can see the differences. Um, the picture on the top is the one that's been provided by the government. And the one in the bottom is the one provided by the NGO. So there are, there are differences on the sturdiness of the uh, Huntara buildings. Next, please. And because there are so many different NGOs and also governments trying to provide the temporary shelters, the quality design and management were different. It varied considerably. You can see the one on the top right is the one provided by the government and the rest were from somebody else. Next, please. And, um, with so much population displaced and then disruptive economies, all levels of government at the national, regional, and also local level have uh, committed to quickly complete the hazard assessment and um, proceed to plan and planning and then um, implement reconstruction projects. What all of them have agreed was that uh, all reconstruction should be safer. And then what that meant was that it will be involving community relocation from hazardous areas that's been affected by tsunami and Nalodo as well as some landslide. Next, please. So uh, with that, there were a plan to systematically and deliberately proceed with the uh, hazard assessment. And then based on the result of the hazard assessment, the mitigation measure will be provided. And then also the land use and development regulation uh, were to be recommended. Next, please. So the master plan was completed really quickly about three months later after the event on uh, 31st of December, 2018. And then the proposed policies were accepted by the central Sulawesi province, which means this master plan is now is the basis for rebuilding. 
But this was actually prepared by the national government involving seven agencies, ministries, as well as authority. And that was headed by the National De Development Planning Agency called BAPENAS with technical assistance from JICA, which is Japan International Cooperation Agency. Next, please. Uh, the master plan has several important components, and one of which were the location of the permanent relocation areas. And um, there were four that was proposed in the master plan. And then when we visited sites in uh, November 2019, three of them were under construction, which were with the map clockwise, it was Tondo, Hombewe, and Duya. The fourth one was not yet constructed and, and is still under discussion as of now because um, of its difficult complexity of the location where it's located outside Palu City but then close to the city center. The master plan also included the regional infrastructure plan also uh, recommended for new regulation for building construction in central Sulawesi. Basically, the master plan was aiming for a more resilient, more uh, inclusive, holistic, and more sustainable future rebuilding of, through the rebuilding that area will be more uh, resilient. Next, please. So the hazard map was developed with a collaborative effort. It also included different levels of government. Six ministries and national agencies were involved. They were sharing all information that they had before and obtained after the event. At the regional level, provincial governor and provincial legislature was included. And also three affected districts of Palu, Sigi, and Dongala were included in this development. And this was a really important process for having all the uh, stakeholders to understand where would be the future high risk areas and then where it would be safer area to develop. And it, the process itself was a good way of sharing information and mutual developing mutual understanding. And the map wasn't official until all have signed. And so the one that we are showing right now on the screen is the one that was signed on December 2018. And however, there were some resistance on the red zones from the local government because they would like to reduce the area coverage. And because of that, the details of implementation are still under debate. Next, please. So I want to walk through a little bit about what it means by being red zone and orange zone. And the definition of the red zone is that the area that were liquefied with the 2018 event. The tsunami zone that falls under red zone is the zone that is 100 meter inland from the high tide point for the most of the Palu Bay, and then 200 meter for the head of the bay. Default zones are also considered hazardous and that falls under red zone if it's within 10 meter of the uh, fault. And landslide zones are the zone prone to the movement after the earthquake. So what it means if it's been designated, the land has been designated as red zone is that the, no new construction can be done. So basically if you had a house in red zone beforehand and you lost the house, you cannot come back and live in the red zone. You need to be relocated. If you had a house that is still standing, 
but in the red zone that you are recommended to be moving out from the red zone. For the orange zone, basically it follows the criteria of the red zone, but then with the lesser uh, impact of the hazard. However, in orange zone, you can't have new residential building or uh, critical or high occupancy facilities. And if you had a residential uh, building in the orange zone, it has to comply with the newest uh, building code that's been passed in 2012 and then um, revised in 2019. And the other thing is that the if there's under undeveloped areas in orange zone, it will be prioritized for agriculture. Next, please. So this hazard map is the base for the land use decisions, but it's really, really difficult and facing multiple challenges. Uh, basically, where it's been affected by the disasters, um, the map has no green zone. So every uh, location is challenging to rebuild. For example, if you see the map, um, the permanent relocation site has to be built outside the red zone, orange or orange zone. So it'll be on yellow zone. And then if any new construction is to be happening in yellow zone, it must follow the new building code. And so for the details of the hazard map is still under debate, including boundaries and reconstruction approach. And local governments are preferring fewer restrictions, especially because this is a local disaster, meaning it's not a, a designated as a national disaster with limited national funding. So whatever decision of um, the land use are made, whether red or orange or yellow, and then policies that come out from that, all of the implementation has to be, most of the implementation has to be borne with the local government. They have to find a way to fund it. And the National Standard Building Code needs to be mostly applied in that area. Um, red zone boundaries are particularly complicated and com controversial because if the area will, is designated as red zone, then residents need to relocate. So the details really matter. Next, please. So I'll, I'll um, pass on to Rob. Okay, and I should be able to take control of the slides. Um, well, thank you, Kanako. So, um, so up to this point, we've learned about the uh, basic effects of the earthquake. Uh, we found out about uh, uh, temporary uh, short-term population displacement as a result of the earthquake and the process of planning for, um, for long-term recovery. So the question is, um, how is it going? Um, so we visited in November 2019, which was about uh, something just happened here. The slide just, uh, did I do that? Might not be the case. Might be the case that Maggie's internet dropped. Okay. It was. Okay, well, there we are back again. Anyway, um, so um, so we were there in November 2019, which is about um, uh, 13, 14 months after the, um, the earthquake. So the question is how, how well was the planned recovery proceeding at that time? So the, um, the overwhelming um, overriding context was one of continuing uncertainty. And this is largely because those processes, I mean, what was really unique about this earthquake was those two really unusual processes, the tsunami that occurred without any warning time and the, um, the Nalodo, the, the liquefaction-induced flow slides um, where large areas of the ground turned completely into liquid. Um, 
So these still aren't completely understood. Um, and a couple of aspects about it. So one, first of all, that these were these really two unusual phenomena. They obviously they killed a lot of people. They frightened a lot of people. They displaced all those people into the camps and the temporary Huntara. You can imagine um, what it must have been like being there at the time when you know the en entire earth is suddenly um, uh, not not functioning anymore, right? The ground is turning to liquid. The you know waves are are washing over the shores, um, and so people were really frightened, and and there were a uh, short-term displacement because of that. And then in the longer term, obviously the people on the coastlines and in the liquefaction affected areas um, had to move. Um, and this process of determining um, sort of where we can permanently rebuild, um, it's it's difficult to do so when we still don't completely understand um, those those processes and sort of knowing where it is safe to build. So this this lack of understanding of the phenomena creates uncertainty for everybody. Certainly, it's uncertain, continuing to be uncertain for the residents, for the farmers, for the fishermen. But it's also difficult for the um, for the local officials to be able to make. Um, firm decisions about what places are risky and which places are not. Um, so looking at these in turn, let's see, let's try to go. I advanced two slides. There we go. Let's see if it stays there. Okay, so, um, so the, um, the tsunami-related building restrictions uh, create uncertainty. So again, we know the tsunami was caused by some combination, uh, probably, of the strike slip fault running through the bay, um, underwater landslides, the slides from the um, uh, from the sides of the bay. Um, but exactly um, which of those elements um, contributed in which way um, is still not known. Uh, how often do such events occur? And and therefore, how far inland is safe? You know, how safe is safe? So research is ongoing on these, and you know, we're we're learning more things about these all the time. But um, meanwhile, um, the the local government and and for the good of the local population, they need to make permanent rebuilding decisions um, before the science is really complete. Um, this obviously this creates uncertainty for the local fishing economy. So a lot of fishermen would like to be able to rebuild their homes on the coast, but they're not allowed. So they they like to they would live there right next to their boats, um, but now because they're in a red zone, they need to move to um, to a permanent huntop. Or um, I'll talk in a little while about some of these smaller satellite huntops. But the point is they need to move somewhere else to where permanent. Um, housing reconstruction is going on. And so will they still uh, easily be able to fish from, they'll live in these different locations, they're far away from their boats, and what kind of uses should be allowed um, near the water? What kinds of, um, you know, uh, fishing facilities um, or any kind of public facilities for that matter? Um, and they have these uh, 100 meter and 200 meter um, uh, distances from the mean high tide determining the red zone, but they're really, they're arbitrary to some extent. They're based on what happened in this one event, but if we don't know the exact cause or the frequency of such events, then it's hard to say um, how safe those um, distances are um, for future events, how likely such future events might be. Um, so as far as the, uh, the liquefaction, um, so it occurred at a lot of locations all over the valley, um, five different locations as, as we saw, and, and here they are shown on this map. Um, so how do we know which places are, are safe? Um, the, um, so in some ways, it, it's a, there's a natural phenomenon here, and that word nalodo tells us that it's in the indigenous language. We know that there's a that this area has been subject to these kinds of processes in the past. Um, on the other hand, as I'll show you in a minute, um, there are um, uh, sort of human contributions to, um, to each of these five particular locations. Um, but again, um, without complete understanding of it, we don't know, were these, are these the only five places where this could happen? Um, uh, if you recall the map earlier, the red zones, all of the, all of the exact, these precise places that liquefied in this event, these are the red zones but all the areas around them are 
orange zone. So every place near them supposedly should, it, it theoretically has the same potential for uh, liquefaction to occur. But again, without knowing the exact causes, we don't know how often it can occur, and we don't know the exact risk in, in those orange zone areas that are adjacent to the places where liquefaction happened. Um, and just to highlight the human causes, so um, at four of the five sites, all of the ones on the east side of the valley, um, there was an unlined irrigation channel which contributed to the initiation of, of those landslides. Um, again, so that was really key, but, um, uh, but again, we don't know, so it, it contributed, but we don't know how much of the contribution there was, and again, don't know how likely it would be for um, these kinds of phenomena to occur in other places at other times. And the fifth site on the other side of the valley, uh, Balaroa, um, we understand was built on, uh, people recognize that it was an existing wetland area that it was built on, but maybe there are other such places in the valley as well. So again, we, we know that these five locations were problematic and that there were some um, uh, human errors involved in them. Um, but we can't really with great assurance say that everywhere else in the valley is completely safe either. So that's kind of the continuing uncertainty there. And um, some of the uh, problems involved with the, um, why this is a problem in terms of not being able to completely, completely know where safe um, so we know that the liquefaction made a large area, the areas that were directly affected by it, we know that those areas are unlivable. Um, this one is the Petabo area, and so all of this here all slid. Um, you saw the previous slide in Balaroa, you could see the area that's, um, that's unlivable. Um, but in addition to that, um, because this irrigation canal was involved, the irrigation canal was um, Damage, it's no longer functioning. Um, and so not only, is, not only is this affecting the farmers, um, the ones who were, who were on the land that slid, but it's affecting all the other farmers in the area because there's no irrigation has stopped. So farming on all of the, not just the damaged land, but all the intact lands in the valley all around there um, can't go on. And again, at the time we were there, farmers had been idle for um, four, over 14 months. Um, we thought that was really a huge problem that needs to be addressed in, in some way. Um, it's continuing on now. Um, and, you know, obviously there's, there's no, um, well, it's a problem for the uh, um, area economy. Um, I'm sure it's a problem for food supply in the area. Um, but again, the farmers aren't getting any income and the farmers don't have anything to do. So, um, and again, it's, it's a much wider area than just the places that were struck by liquefaction. And, um, and so we need some kind of a permanent solution, but it's, there's a bit of a paradox, which is that they need water to farm. Um, they need to have irrig irrigation is how they've been farming there, but having high groundwater is what causes the liquefaction hazard. So perhaps there's some way to, to solve this with different kinds of watering systems or maybe different kinds of agriculture. But again, um, and, and I'm, I think we can assume that in the next few years um, that studies will be able to figure this out, but we don't really know enough right now. And meanwhile, the farmers need, um, they need a place to live and they need their livelihoods. Um, so there were all kinds of phenomena that happened as a result of this earthquake, not only the tsunami and the liquefaction, but there was also significant surface fault rupture in Palu. Um, the fault goes right through the middle of the city of Palu. There were average displacements of about five meters. Um, and um, they've designated a red zone, um, uh, I think it was uh, 10 meters. Um, but again, sort of the question is, you know, how exactly how big that should be. Um, and some houses are like, once you draw that precise line, um, some houses are partly in, in the red zone, maybe a small part of the house is in the red zone. So some of these details about which are the places that need to relocate are still being sorted out. And as you can see in this one, right in the middle there, there's a mosque. Um, and that was um, quickly, the mosque quickly rebuilt itself after the earthquake. 
Um, and so there's a question to what degree is that, is that okay? Can we let the mosque stay there? Um, you know, what, what, what does one do about that? And of course, we also mentioned the waterfront landslide. So this one, for example, in Boya Village, it occurred on old filled land from the colonial period. Um, many residents uh, living in homes on this lost their lives. And so is it still safe for people to actively use the land? What about all of these adjacent areas here? Is that, is that all okay? Um, so again, we, we don't know, but need to make permanent decisions. Um, so all this uncertainty, but again, people need their homes, they need their livelihoods. So the, the approach that the government took in this case, and this is what we're trying to learn from, is they focused on providing safe housing quickly, even understanding that we had incomplete hazard information. Um, they created that map. Um, they got all of the agencies, um, the technical agencies and policy agencies to agree to it, knowing that still um, um, uh, information was limited, but there were some approximate rules of thumb that they could use to develop the map to be able to say that some areas were riskier than others. Um, and then within the framework of that, um, prioritizing rebuilding housing right away first. And within that, they, they were able to, and they were able to do that by adapting existing housing programs that they already had used before. Um, and again, setting the priorities, the first priority was to build um, these um, few large huntops, large reconstruction housing areas um, to take care of a lot of the high priority immediate needs. And this one pictured here on the right is the one in Tondo. Um, this is an, an aerial shot of that, and it, it will have, uh, ultimately have 1,500 homes in it. Um, so they, so they um, got these going right away with then working on some of these smaller ones on urban infill sites, what they call satellite hunt taps. Those are still in process. And then in situ reconstruction, which is places that aren't in the red zone, so they could rebuild in place. Um, that also was in process, and here on the, um, the bottom part of the slide is an example of one of those that was going on. So this sort of staged um, uh, reconstruction where they, again, they, they developed the, um, the, uh, a simplified hazard map to find the, the identify the most obviously bad places, um, find some places where they could um, felt reasonably comfortable um, building um, these, but they could build, quickly build these large housing tracks and then working on more detailed housing policies over time. Um, but again, these, um, the, these large ones, the large hunt tops, um, they were prioritized to get those going right away because they could provide some immediate needs. Um, but understanding that these are not really complete communities, that it's housing only. Um, they're not, they're um, disconnected from a lot of infrastructure and urban services. And, and there's a reason for that is because where they could find these large tracts of land available, they were available for a reason because they had been, they were less, less desirable and less well connected to the urban system than other places. Um, and so on the other hand, these um, more infill kind of uh, places within the existing urban fabric, the satellite hunt tops, a really better longer term solution for creating not just housing, but for create, recreating communities, um, but they take longer longer to build. And so this was all still in early stages of being sorted out at the time of our visit in November. Uh, okay, and now, um, so we have some updates um, uh, now that it's been six months since our visit, and I'm going to, turn it over to Rahma and then Kanako. Okay. Uh, thank you. So the update since um, November, um, we, okay. For the update since November, we have um, been progressing uh, a, a lot of things. 
But unfortunately, in uh, 2020, Indonesia is also affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And on April 13, the president declared um, as a national state of emergency on COVID. And this national state of emergency is the third time in Indonesia. The last was the 2004 Aceh Nias uh, earthquake and tsunami. And so, um, because of this pandemic, the Hunta reconstruction is currently proceeding slowly. The original timeline is um, like uh, starting to be uh, hand over this month uh, on May, but because the reconstruction uh, is proceeding slowly after impeded by this COVID, so um, it cannot be finished by this May, but it's still aiming to finalize by the end of this year. The reconstruction is still being on progress and uh, they also um, um, employ the COVID protocols for all the workers in Palu. On the other hand, the life in Huntaras um, is becoming more difficult because of this uh, COVID-19. And so from the three big uh, junta that is currently on progress, it's um, approximately about 70-80% uh, um, finished. And one of the uh, government junta um, in the border of Palu City and Sigi Regency is still uh, under discussion. Um, aside of this uh, big permanent um, uh, sites, there are also the smaller site of uh, satellite type, and the satellite satellite type is uh, also uh, uh, in uh, progressing. Uh, I would also mention that currently there's also um, uh, Dr. Yoga from Bapenas and uh, Bu Arum from Bapenas that also attended this uh, webinar. So thank you. And the next Kanako, thank you. And the second update is the uh, updates for the red zone residents. The mayor of Palu about a month and a half ago asked red zone residents to decide on their relocation plan by end of this month. And then what it means by um, deciding on their relocation decision is that whether to collectively relocate to the government provided uh, permanent relocation site, Huntaps, or to take the Mandiri, which means individual process. And this Mandiri program has been um, introduced to people recently because a lot of individual, a lot of people didn't want to move into the collective Huntap site. And then because of, in response to that, it, the program has been introduced. But then what um, people have to decide is that the government only support the basic infrastructure in the collective Huntap sites. And so if uh, people just, the household decides to relocate individually, that means they have to figure out how to be connected to the basic infrastructure. And so far, only a few residents have responded to the mayor's request, although um, it's due end of this month. But housing construction is still targeted for the end of uh, 2020 because the president initially declared the date when uh, this rebuilding started. Next, please. And the other update is the coastal infrastructure. Right now, Netherlands is working on an eight kilometer sea deck design that's been funded by a loan from ADB Asian Development Bank. In the map, you can see uh, the location in the uh, bay that's represented by the yellow line. And this is aimed to protect against erosion and heavy storm conditions. At the same time, Shaika is working on an elevated road for coastal protection, also protection from future tsunamis that's been uh, funded by a loan from Japan. And uh, this agreement was signed this year, early January, and um, it is represented with the red line on the uh, figure. And these two structures will definitely affect land uses 
along the coast and then also the coastal access. It might also affect the coastal zone uh, reconstruction restrictions. And at this point, um, it's not really clear how tsunami and other coastal hazard will be determined and then also the land use of the area. So this is something that we probably need to follow. Next, please. And back to Rama. So um, despite uh, that uh, the mechanism is still um, unclearly understand, but also the massive, a massive ongoing studies is currently undergoing um, involving multi institutions, multi disciplines, um, many um, um, international collaboration. Uh, there are um, there have been many field research um, and also graduate students involved uh, for both of the liquefaction studies, uh, or we call it NALODO, the flow slide, the fault detail mapping, and tsunami mechanism. Uh, the government has provided has uh, developed the detail mapping by aerial mapping to study all this uh, mechanism. And also we uh, have done several boring and sampling and trenching to understand better the liquefaction. And um, we have done some bathymetry survey as well to understand better the fault detail mapping, both onshore and offshore. We understand uh, currently that the rapid uh, shear rupture um, and crossing to the bay, to the Palu Bay, uh, trigger both landslide and uh, trigger the tsunami that the tsunami come to the coastline very rapidly just only in three to four minutes so the current early warning system is provided by bmkg within five minutes so it's not possible to rely on the tsunami warning systems and the splashing uh, water from the tsunami still bring a lot of energy that um, pro that give damage uh, to the coastal area and so more modeling is currently undergoing to understand better on the detail mechanism and also the expected probability. But we believe that this will happen again sometime in the future, uh, probably every once in a century. And so this is also a really effect on how the development in Palu is going to be designed, including the irrigation channel design that is still currently under discussion. Um, the main uh, disaster mitigation effort that is uh, currently ongoing is also on more on the spatial planning and how to adapt with this um, unique phenomena. Uh, so next is to Prof. Rob. Great, thank you, Rahma. Um, so um, a brief summary here. So we've um, thrown a lot of information at you. Um, I think the main points we want to take from this are, first of all, that um, there were two highly unusual earthquake phenomena that um, occurred in this, um, uh, in this instance, the, the immediate tsunami and these liquefaction flow slides. Um, and as a result of this, a major effect of this disaster was that thousands of people were displaced um, in the short term, which, which was a problem, and now they continue to be displaced in the long term for a variety of reasons, and that's a continuing problem. Um, and this is all happening in the context of extreme uncertainty regarding um, future risk of reoccurrence of those um, earthquake-triggered um, phenomena. So um, solving the housing crisis in a timely manner was a high priority here, and it required quick decisions, quick risk decisions using simple rules um, so that they could rebuild now, even if not completely sure of long-term safety, but um, could avoid some of the most obvious worst places. Um, this emphasis on, on housing, which was, which was important, um, but there's only so many things you can do at once. And so by emphasizing housing, it's, it's not, um, they haven't paid um, enough attention to livelihoods at the, at the same time, at least as quickly as dealing with the housing problem. In particular, um, we continue to be concerned with farmers who are um, idled by the, um, by the Nalodo liquefaction, um, and that seems to pose a significant um, crisis situation for the region. Um, and so what we hope um, for all of you who are attending this is that 
on the one hand, this, this Palo case has a lot of unique challenges and issues that are unusual in the world of earthquake recovery. And um, we think EERI members should be find it interesting just for, for those reasons alone. Um, but, the, um, but the implications of these challenges and issues involving these trade-offs between um, rapidly um, rebuilding housing and the economy um, and trying to um, develop knowledge at the same time to be able to do these things wisely so that they could build back more safely. Um, these kinds of difficult trade-off decisions are, um, are common challenges in all of the large earthquake disasters that we face. And we think that they play out in particularly interesting and visible ways um, in this particular case that help us to think about these things better. Um, and we are, um, well, let's see, last slide, there we go. So this is the, the end of the presentation. Um, there's our, our group. Um, if you know, um, there were, it began with three of us. Um, Rachma then became an integral part of our group. We had so many collaborators, you saw all the lists of them. We were never in the field. There were never three or four of us in the field at any one time, you see all of us here. And, um, and we're continuing to collaborate. Um, we'll have a report um, in the coming months, um, but we've also um, really initiated a longer term process of collaborating between ourselves and our, our colleagues in Indonesia. Um, and, um, and this is, we encourage all EERI members who are interested in collaborating on this to um, communicate with us and we can make appropriate connections with researchers in Indonesia. Um, and this would be a really positive um, uh, outcome of this work that we've done. So um, that's it with our presentation. Thank you. Thank you all for the great presentation. We do have time for questions, so please continue, continue to enter any questions you have into the questions panel. Um, so the first question is uh, maybe in two parts. Um, the first is, did you make any observations or have um, understanding of the performance of traditional or vernacular houses um, from the earthquake? And then also, um, how is that being factored into some of the reconstruction, um, considering that there are now new building code requirements for, um, for new construction? Uh, well, that wasn't, um, the uh, structural issues were not a focus, but I think um, perhaps Gazala might be able to make a few comments on that, or at the very least to say a few things about um, some of the small scale um, uh, construction that we saw going on. Yeah, thank you, Rob. In fact, um, um, traditional houses were made of um, uh, wood, and uh, we just heard about that and we couldn't see any of that um, in the factory area. And we, 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 we learned stories that in previous Naloro and some other um, mm -hmm. events, the, um, um, by indigenous knowledge, if they know uh, the feel the earthquake, the elders, they, they ask the people to relocate and just uh, uh, move their house. So by dismantling the wooden parts, they, they just, they can, they could move their house to safer location. But now I think there is, uh, Mm -hmm. There is no uh, traditional house, and we all see the, what is that non-engineered construction of uh, concrete. Um, so that is the reason that it was damaged heavily. And uh, building code uh, and uh, building bylaws and regulations were not uh, much followed before the earthquake. So most of the housing damage and building damage was attributed to that uh, non-engineered construction. Otherwise, if there would be um, uh, traditional houses of wood, then it might be less uh, damage. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kazala. I was also gonna um, uh, build on that question, not just traditional structures, but um, thinking about sort of traditional methods of, of building and siting communities. And maybe Rahma can make a few comments about that. There, there's continuing learning 
as I mentioned, Palo is actually a new city, um, but there are various indigenous populations who lived in the area for a long time. And um, these phenomena have, it's a, it's a, it's a hazardous place. And these uh, earthquake related phenomena have been going on there for a long time. And we're increasingly learning the degree to which traditional cultures are actually um, aware of some of these things. And I don't know if Rachma can, uh, was telling us a little bit about some of what they're learning. Um, I don't see your microphone on. There we go. Uh, yes, um, in the top rock. So um, when we visited um, Palu and um, Okay, yes, indeed, uh, Prof, Prof, when we visited uh, Palu and communicating with the local people, we understand that um, eventually some geographical names are given um, based on what phenomena that has happened in the area. And also it's very likely that uh, there are some um, local knowledge that understand this uh, so-called um, Nalodo uh, Nalodo uh, phenomena, which is um, the phenomena that is um, uh, what we called liquefaction and flow slide. So in the local term is uh, Nalodo. And there are also a village, for example, that is given name of Beka. Beka means um, ruptured. So this Beka village is uh, passed by the uh, earthquake rupture and it was given the similar name that uh, actually maybe it's because it was rupture uh, several times before. There are a lot of a lot of names, local names that we find. Um, there is Ama here from the local community that attended this uh, webinar uh, uh, that we learned from her as well uh, on how uh, actually they also learn about some um, local wisdom that is a ginamo maunga nemo maunga that is better to be um, aware, uh, so not to be drowned, and uh, also to be um, uh, careful with the nature. So the Kylie, the Kylie, um, uh, the Kylie, what uh, culture is one of the local culture that uh, understand this. And apparently, it's interesting to see that the very, uh, very local people living in Palu is mainly them who survived the, the Palu earthquake, where the commerce uh, is mostly uh, where the most of the victims uh, happened. So apparently, there is some uh, local knowledge that remained in Palu that we need to dig more and we need to understand more and to spread more about this local wisdom. Maybe this, there is the small um, addition. Yeah. That's great, thanks. Okay, next question. Um, this is a, a comment from one of the participants that they understood that the recovery has been very top down. Um, so maybe if you can address that and, and say if that's also uh, your impression and also if that, how that approach is impacting the decisions of focusing on housing uh, versus livelihoods. Um, yeah, well, I'll give a try at that and then maybe Kanako might um, add to it. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's evolving. Um, so I think at the time that this happened, um, you can just imagine how unbelievably overwhelming um, this event was for this locality with, um, you know, all of those, you know, thousands of, of um, sort of self-organized displaced people. I mean, that's sort of how it, it started. And there weren't any, um, the airport was closed. They weren't getting any supplies. People were just sort of standing together on hilltops for like a week until they could start, you know, getting tents and food and things like that. And so it sort of began that way. Um, the, the local government was overwhelmed in so many ways by the size of this disaster, the nature of the disaster. Um, and it's a, it's a remote place. It's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not the center of, of Indonesia. Um, so their um, capacity was a, is, is a little bit 
lower anyway than than other parts of Indonesia. Um, and so it's for the for these reasons, the um, the central government um, really stepped in and and understood that they wanted to be able to rebuild quickly. And so the central government sort of initially led um, this this planning process and got and got assistance from uh, from Japan through JICA as well. But eventually the the implementation needs to be um, local and um, and again this wasn't a national scale disaster so it sort of you know so you could see it sort of began as a as a top-down sort of thing but as time goes on here um, the responsibilities for implementing it are increasingly um, at the at the local level um, and that there still are some decisions that they're making. This, so, you know, everybody agreed to this map in December 2018, um, but we've seen other other draft versions of the risk map that are being circulated as negotiations continue to maybe make revisions to some of these things. They're changing a lot of these programs over time. That that Mandiri program was something that was just added more recently. So. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think it. I, I think it. You could see that it began very much um, top down, but I think it's an evolving process. And I'll see if uh, uh, Kanako has been um, looking at these issues and see if she wants to um, add any additional comments to that. Well, thank you, Rob. I think Rob has um, answered most of the um, important part, but I think the reason it seems really top down is what Rob also have addressed. The uh, disaster itself was really overwhelming and that was beyond what can be responded at the local level at the very beginning. But um, Indonesia is a very government government structurally it's um very decentralized and then all the land use plan and um all the rebuilding initiatives are supposed to be happening at the local level and then i also see that's been um the decision powers will probably have to be given to the local government and then they will probably gradually start working on rebuilding uh, with their initiatives. And even um, the national level plan, it really emphasized um, for the rebuilding process of inclusive and uh, participatory. So I hope it will also be uh, directed that way in the near future. And then as far as the um, top-down governance on the impact of like providing housing only rather than livelihood. I think it's not only about Indonesia, but then everywhere else that's been affected by a uh, large scale disaster. The first thing, and it also is very critical to provide the shelter and a uh, place to live. And so often um, the first step is uh, providing housing and then the livelihood aspect are uh, fall, considered to follow after the houses are provided. So I think it's not the um, case of this Palu and rebuilding, but it's something that we have to start thinking about when uh, given rebuilding policy or thinking about the rebuilding, uh, the housing has to be um, provided together with the livelihood um, reestablishment. So it's the way that uh, planner and maybe the policymaker would probably have to think um, and revise in thinking about it. So that's be my comment. Oh, great, thanks. <laughs> okay, we have a couple of questions related to, to building codes. So the first part is if the, the adopted building codes have any provisions for tsunami resistance, and if not, um, are those being in uh, considered for incorporation and um, also along the lines of building codes. How is the enforcement of building codes um, working in terms of reconstruction? Well, um, again, this wasn't, I know this is of great interest to EERI members. Um, our, our focus meaning, being mostly on the, um, the, the population um, uh, um, uh, 
dislocation issues. Um, so I don't know if maybe, I think maybe a few comments on this, possibly from Ghazala and possibly from Rachma, but we, we've been talking about some, we don't really know many of the details um, of the building code issues other than um, the fact that it's been um, updated in, in recent years and, and the, the, you know, required to be followed. Ghazala might know some things about the tsunami requirements, but um, but probably, perhaps not yet. So, is there anything you Thank can... you, Rob. Uh, in fact, yeah, like other um, like other developing countries issue, building code implementation uh, is also um, uh, has been an issue in Indonesia, and especially as you said that this is not uh, uh, very close to Jakarta or not very. Uh, uh, well developed area so building code enforcement is still um uh, an, an issue there so pre earthquake uh, building construction uh, was uh, what i have seen um and you have also noticed that almost every building in palo has you know big cracks and and it seemed dangerous to um to to uh, live there but still it is being used and um, uh, for, for the for next reconstruction they are trying to uh trying to follow the building code for the reconstruction the huntap reconstruction is really really good as it is being um, um, constructed by the government and, and the government hired contractors but for for owner own owner driven construction maybe it's an issue and they have uh, dealt it with the uh, with the with the process that uh, pre uh, pre qualified contractors can only construct the uh, reconstruction of the individual houses, one thing. But for the other area which have only the uh, partial damage of the building, I think until until the, the time we were there. There was nothing such thing to how to retrofit that those areas or how to enforce building code at that time. But the architects and engineers associations were working on that. Um, for tsunami uh, code, I think there's there's nothing like that um, being an implementation in Indonesia. Even in Pakistan, we don't have such thing. But uh, the only thing we can do is. Uh, um, make some land use plans for uh, for safety from tsunami and other coastal hazards, but still it's not yet done in Indonesia and especially in Pali. Thank you. Good, thanks, Katara. So if I may, um, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Rock. But, or, yeah, go ahead. Yes, so if I may give some additional uh, comments. Uh, the design code in Indonesia um, um, uh, is the, the newest is 2019. It's just released, and before this is on 2012. But most of the building in Spalu is uh, built based on the building code in 2002. So uh, comparing uh, building code of 2002 and 2012, the uh, response spectra um, the uh, that was designed in 2002 is much lower uh, than the one that is um, uh, designed in 2012. This is because the understanding of the source is different um, back then in 2000 and uh, after in 2010. And uh, so this is also one of the main aspects why there are so many buildings that uh, collapse. But actually, if we compare the uh, response spectra of uh, that uh, was uh, captured by a local uh, accelerometer in Palo City compared to the uh, uh, response spectra in the building code of 2012, it is not so much different. So it means um, if the building is designed uh, based on the 2012 building, building code, there shouldn't have that much um, uh, damage. And uh, 2019 is uh, also a bit higher than the 2012. So now the government uh, is highlighting on the importance of implementing the new building code of 2019. But the other issue here is not only due to the shaking, but also due to tsunami and due to the liquefaction. 
So the government under the Ministry of Public Works is uh, currently uh, developing the building codes based on uh, for the liquefaction. Uh, but also uh, the uh, the the building code for the earthquake doesn't necessarily mean that the building will stand for the tsunami. That is what we learned. And um, there is a currently uh, ongoing uh, publication on the fragility curve. So we we understand now that the fragility curves of the buildings in Palu, uh, like for two meter high, the probability uh, two meter high of tsunami, the probability of damage is higher than the two meter occurring in Aceh. Why? Because um, for in Aceh case, the um, the tsunami occurred like uh, 100 kilometer from the coastline. So then the energy uh, dissipated uh, through the when the 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 wave traveled to the coast uh, for 20 to 30 minutes. But in case of Palu, um, the the arrival to the coast is only three to four minutes, and the energy is still very high. So when it's splashed to the shore, uh, the and the high energy caused the high damage to the buildings. The heat is actually not so heat. It's um, average is about two to uh, three meter height. Although there are also some that is very high, um, and also it's not uh, very far inundated to the inland. It's about 100 to 200. But due to the high energy of the wave. The buildings is likely to damage, and that's why the government then recommend to make it the red zone, uh, 100 meter from the coast and 200 meter in the Palu Bay. Uh, so that is the challenge. That even though the building codes stand for the earthquake, but not necessarily for the tsunami, and um, mainly not for the Nalodo. So, uh, so that's the challenge that occur in uh, Palu area. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks. And following up uh, on the topic of tsunami a little bit, were there any uh, tsunami protection measures in place already in Palu? And um, how is are those kinds of measures being incorporated into recovery plans? Um, well, I don't think there weren't at the time, but um, there's a lot of, I'm trying to think of who, who should best handle this. Um, Maybe everybody. I, I think um, uh, Rachma has a good understanding of the current status of things. That, but Kanako has been following a lot of the tsunami work from JICA and um, and Gazala a, as well is um, been particularly following a lot of the tsunami related things. So I don't know. I'll turn on your microphones. Who wants to grab that one first? Okay, so maybe I, I will start first. Okay. Um, if, okay. So as uh, as far as I understand, um, the tsunami preparedness was in place, but um, not in the scenario of the Palu 2008 earthquake. So what was understand before is that the tsunami can um, happen in Palu from the source, not not from the not from the um, uh, structive fault that crossing this Palu Bay, but we have this uh, Makassar um, mega trust in the northern part of Sulawesi, and the tsunami can affect um, the central Sulawesi and Palu Bay, and it will arrive uh, of about 20 minutes. And so, what was thought uh, before in Palu is that um, the tsunami warning will be in place um, after five minutes, and the siren will be um, will be turned on. And they will have 20 minutes to evacuate. Um, there are several um, uh, route evacuation routes, but apparently it was not enough. Um, there are many um, places that also was blocked, um, not available for the evacuation place. And what was not expected at all is that the tsunami arrived directly after the earthquake, like only three to four minutes. That was not expected. So it was not what has been taught in Palu. So this um, Palu then opened our eyes that the tsunami education cannot be given similarly to all places in Indonesia. Every place has a very local characteristic that needs to be understood before giving the education. Um, and as I understand now, um, 
they uh, they also other than the uh, elevated road they are also building uh, they are also um, planting this mangrove um, funded by the Ministry of Public Works and um, basically originally the very local um, very local uh, wisdom of Indonesia is having this um, coastal forest so the basically uh, uh, the, the in the local knowledge in the local wisdom there is a uh, uh, forest a uh, local uh, what marine co uh, coastal forest and then the people will live behind that but in the modern era people tend to build directly in the coast uh, coastal area and that is also because there has been so long time that in palu uh, bay there are no tsunami but um, in the dongala area for example uh, they uh, they experienced the tsunami in uh, 1960s, so they are more aware. And there, uh, in that place, more people uh, survive due to the tsunami because they directly go to the higher ground after the tsunami happened. And uh, there are also an, an interesting phenomena that the cow uh, the cow run uh, to the high ground, and so the uh, owner of the cow. Uh, try to try to catch the cow but and they are they survive because they follow the cow uh, so that's also interesting uh, phenomena that uh, happen in Palu uh, what the the main the main major of death of tsunami is in Palu Bay it was because in that day 28th of September is the Palu city uh, birthday so they are having a big event celebration in the bay and um, the evacuation route is not provided for that much uh, people that is that was in the bay and so that caused the the big um the many casualties uh uh that happened due to tsunami because there is a celebration and there are there are no no enough evacuation route for hundreds of people in the bay and so and the tsunami come very soon after the the earthquake and so that that caused the massive um, casualties in Palm. That's for me. Great, thanks. Does, uh... Okay, so from my side, what I know um, uh, for uh, for this event, this is a very unique event that that we have only a few minutes. So all the tsunami early warning standard operating procedures in Indonesia are being revised for such a um, fast approaching tsunami, first of all. And the second thing is that they are now focusing more on, uh, you know, educating the communities for, for uh, making them capable of observing natural warning and, and, and self evacuation. So evacuation routes, as Rahma said, are are under study, and they are trying to accommodate uh, in new land use planning and uh, with the red zones and orange zones. Um, the green, the green, uh, green belt like mangrove plantation and coastal forest is uh, being planned immediately on the shore. Then our, uh, the gray area is. Uh, uh, that they are making elevated road as uh, Kanako san she, she told us so they there are some land use planning measures that they are taking it um, on their own but still for community community education is the one thing that is really really important and then uh, uh, tsunami early warning communication or di dissemination infrastructure which was also badly affected by the earthquake shaking and could not be uh, could not you know be utilized during the, uh, uh, the during the event so now it is um, also emphasized that all such dissemination networks and electricity and some other thing that should be very very carefully uh, designed and um, uh, constructed that they should be uh, resilient for earthquake shaking and also for inundation those are the lessons learned and they are with, uh, focusing very much on uh, in you know with, with the reference of this palu case thank you so 
Kanako, do you have anything yeah, to add? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> no, I think I'm just going to make a really quick comment that um, all the discussion is ongoing regarding the infrastructure. And then um, the difficulty, I guess, is that um, how to define the land use um, to be, make it to a red zone and then yellow zone. And then how would that be affected if there would be the uh, high re re raised road um, or vice versa? And um, so that's something that um, uh, we would need to follow up. And um, I think the other thing that also been discussed is the compensation um, in the red zone and yellow zone uh, for the people who had houses there. So um, that's currently ongoing discussion over there and probably need further um, exploration before I can answer to other questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. The, um, you know, I talked about some of the uncertainties for the, um, the fishermen um, along the coast, but if you have the, um, the, um, the, the, the wall that's being um, uh, built from um, the uh, Netherlands, funded by the, with the loan from the Asian Development Bank, you have that plus the raised road that um, that uh, JICA is designing, then the whole coast suddenly becomes very, very different. And it has a lot of land use implications um, in terms of um, access to uh, sort of, you know, fishing ports, access to fishing boats, um, as well as the, the land uses. If you have that, if you have the raised road, which then protects the land behind it, then does that change the red zone? So there's obviously um, a lot of significant ongoing discussions that will be happening along the coastline probably for, for several years. So are we, Maggie, are we kind of at our end here? Yeah, I think so. I think we'll we'll take that as our last question. Can, uh, and can thank you make, all for the. Oh yeah, I go ahead. Make, I just can make a quick comment. I, those are were all great questions. Um, nobody asked about liquefaction or the Naloda, which I'm not sure that we can answer them. But I just want to um, just for listeners, people who are interested in that, um, uh, Gear did a really um, really thorough job. There's a really outstanding uh, report that I commend to everybody. I think it's easily available on the EERI um, uh, site, but you can also just directly search for it. And, and remember, the, the tsunami was really important, but the, um, the, the, these flow slides um, were the greatest they, they don't have the exact numbers, but it's generally accepted that that was the greatest contributor to life loss um, uh, in this event. And uh, we purposely didn't connect to any of the videos on here, but there are some amazing videos that you can see that you can connect to off of GEAR, um, the GEAR report, where you can see how that, that happened. So, um, so just understand that the tsunami was really um, a, 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 a terrible event that happened here, but the, um, but the flow slides from the liquefaction um, were, at, were also as well. Okay, thanks. Great. Thanks again to Rob, Kanako, Gazala, and Rama for the great presentation. We did have some unanswered questions that we will pass along to the presenters. Before we end, we just want to let everyone know that we do have another upcoming webinar from the Learning from Earthquakes program, which is focused on reconnaissance lessons learned from the 2019 LFE Travel Study Program. This will be on May 26th, and more information will be provided in a follow-up email. Finally, we just want to thank you all for attending this webinar. You can learn more about the LFE program at learningfromearthquakes.org. PDH information from the webinar will be available in a follow-up email. Please complete the webinar survey once you exit the webinar. This really helps us improve future webinars and you can suggest topics for future webinars. Um, you can learn more about EERI at EERI.org. And if you're not already an EERI member, please see the follow-up email with information about how to join. Um, finally, we'd just like to thank FEMA for supporting this webinar. Um, and thank you all again for participating. Bye. Bye, thanks. Bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.